Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Evgenia, and I'm part of this year's Inside Out team. There are five of us, myself, Stephanie, Mauricio, Alex, and Phoebe, that curate and organize bi-weekly lectures where we invite internationally renowned practices to discuss their work. Inside Out is probably the RCA's only student-led lecture series. The aim is to use these conversations and lectures to incite, enliven, and cross-fertilize ideas from many design disciplines. Inside Out differentiates itself from other lectures by shifting the content from something polished to a discussion platform that confronts the ebbs and flows, glamour, glitz, and grit of being in the industry. We encourage designers to talk candidly about their career decisions, pitfalls and all. Our guests are asked to share advice and personal experience about getting started in the field, <coughs> valuable lessons learned, and share any professional insight. Today, we're proud to present Charlie Edmonds from Future Architects Front. Future Architects Front is a grassroots organization of architectural workers and students. FAF campaigns to end the exploitative practices that have come to define the world of architecture. They work both within and without existing institutions, collaborate with unions and collectives, and act as the loud, abrasive voice of those at the bottom of the professional hierarchy. Charlie Edmonds is a London-based designer and writer working across the fields of architecture, climate transition, and political economy. He's a graduate of the University of Cambridge, where he co-founded Future Architects Front with Preeti Mohandas. Charlie is assistant designer at Civic Square in Birmingham, where he works to demonstrate the potential of grassroots retrofit and the devolved urban climate transition. Through Future Architects Front and Civic Square, Charlie's work seeks to establish emerging forms of anti-capitalist organizations situated within the reproduction of the built environment. Please welcome Charlie. Okay, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, everyone who's helped organize this today. Um, I'm definitely not an internationally renowned practice, but hopefully <laughs> I do insight and enlightenment. So some of that will hopefully be true. So um, this is actually the first time that uh, we've kind of completely redone the, the content that we present at lectures. So for the sort of year and a half that we've been doing this, um, at, I think over 20 different universities now, we've always tried to focus on how sort of FAF started and what its aims are and how we basically try to do activism uh, from the position of uh, architectural workers. And this is the first time that I've really tried to sort of de-center ourselves within what I want to talk about because I think what, what I've sort of learned in the year and a half of doing these talks is that I think it's so much more valuable to center on the sort of class position of people in the room right now studying, working in architecture uh, than it is to very narrowly focus on how we have tried to sort of leverage the institution against itself. But that being said, I, I, I should probably still explain why I'm here, so I, so I will do a bit of an introduction to that nonetheless. So if you've come across us um, before, it's probably been in one of these two uh, formats, either an Instagram page or a Twitter page. And this is because we started during lockdown. We started as uh, graduates with no sort of institutional power, uh, no sort of positionality within the architectural profession to leverage. And so we leveraged the only thing that was available to us at the time, um, the sort of digital media landscape. And this has played a really important role in how FAF as a sort of like largely digital organizing entity has developed. So to begin with, the strength of the platform was that anyone could send us a message and talk about their experiences of architectural practice. This then could be shared anonymously. Uh, and through this almost like confessional style of communication, we started to see not only the 
page growing in people's attention and interest, but also we started to see sort of um, a response, uh, an almost like anonymous conversation that was happening where people were able to actually express solidarity with one another uh, through the shared experiences that they were talking about, largely things to do with um, overwork and exploitation from the perspective of architectural workers. So we sort of took, um, you know, these experiences and we took the data that we were able to gather about the architecture profession, um, things like, are you paid overtime? Um, what, what are, you, are you employed? Are you not employed? Are you an architectural assistant? Are you an architect? Things like this. And we used the sort of data that we gathered to write an open letter to the Royal Institute of British Architects. The reason we chose the repo was because that final question there, you'll notice, is almost uh, entirely no. And the question was, do you feel supported by Reba? So they sort of evidently, uh, and for good reason, became our first sort of target in terms of an institution that we wanted to try and leverage through our position as organizers. And this uh, was really well received. Um, the demands were fairly straightforward to end unpaid overtime in charts of practices, to uh, introduce more transparency about institute um, funding and spending, to uh, introduce more representatives of governing bodies. And it was signed by over 1800 people, which considering, you know, this was the very first thing we'd ever really done. Um, FAF had existed for maybe a month or two at this point. Um, like I said, the reception was uh, really incredible. And um, I think it's a testament to the potential of this kind of, you know, digital native grassroots organizing. And um, while things seemed, uh, you know, quite optimistic at the beginning, we, we met with Reba several times. They had promised to consult on things like banning on bed overtime, uh, as is sort of typical for these kinds of um, old inner institutions. Nothing really ever came of it, which was why the, at the next cycle of the Reba presidential elections, we said, okay, then if the people in Reba right now won't do anything, let's put new people in Reba. So alongside groups like UBW Saw, the Union, Architects Climate Action Network, um, alongside the original Reba Future Architects group and many, many others, we sort of launched a collaborative campaign to run our own hustings, uh, select our own um, presidential candidate who we then supported in the real election process. And in case you haven't uh, heard, uh, he won. So Moy was now going to um, become the new Reba president from September, which is incredibly exciting. Obviously, there's a limit to what one person can do in an institution like this. So, um, you know, keep your eye out uh, in the next couple of weeks because we'll also be launching some new election campaigns for uh, council seats that are going to be um, opening soon as well. So if anyone here wants to become a Reba councillor, let me know. Um, we're also really interested in education. Um, and so, you know, another thing we did quite early on was to look at how workers and students feel about the university education right now. And we conducted more surveys, we shared the results. Uh, we got asked to meet with the ARB um, to talk about these results. This uh, consultation process, which was with us, but with many, many other people, um, who you know are trying to sort of reform and push forward architectural education has sort of led to the current um, you know ongoing proposals for fairly um, a significant change in the in the pathway to qualification. Um, the uh, original intention was to create the most sort of you know significant changes in fifty years. Arguably, there, the ambition may have been scaled back a little bit now, but the good news is that there is another open consultation um, right now that you can all go to right now and um, respond to. So if you want to try and push them to be a bit more radical, we have the sort of um, you know democratic capacity to do that. And so, yeah, this is sort of, in a nutshell, like how 
path operates, right? Like we sort of leverage our position as a uh, social media digital entity uh, to sort of, you know, critique architecture, critique the institutions of architecture, and then to try and use that same platform to sort of organize at a grassroots level um, towards, you know, leveraging the, the collective voice that we're able to channel. So the, these are two examples of how we can do that through leveraging existing institutions. And a lot of the time, the way that we communicate this critique, and I think the thing that makes a lot of older institutions unsure of how to deal with us, is that we often communicate critique like this. So a huge amount of the time, um, we, we sort of take advantage of the language of the internet, uh, the sort of meme formats in order to not only sort of do organizing, do activism, but do it in a way that's not quite as soul crushing as it you know otherwise would likely be. And um, again, you know, it's not only a, a vehicle for critique, but it's um, also a sort of vehicle for accessibility. Because you know, I think some people might look at this and think that's a bit lowbrow. And I would say, yeah, it is. That's the point. Um, the point is that it's the bar to getting involved in this kind of uh, organizing a discussion is is low, it's accessible. And uh, yeah, so we you know we definitely don't make any apologies for that and I think we've seen a lot of um, effectiveness in this way of uh, communicating. Now this is where I sort of get to talk about the things that I really want to talk about, which is beyond us as an organization, why is it important to be doing this kind of work? Like is it necessary to be agitating like this or are we just sort of causing trouble for the sake of it and i think the first reason why i'd argue it is incredibly necessary to be doing this and all other kinds of organizing activism within through built environment right now is because over the last um sort of 50 years we've seen what i and many others have described as the proletarianization of architectural workers and so what I mean by that is that traditionally architects and architectural workers have been part of, um, you know, the sort of white collar um, section of the economy, right? Like we're seen as professionals rather than workers. And another way of sort of describing this historic condition of architectural workers is um, labor aristocracy. So you know, labor aristocracy is essentially people who, like the working class, have nothing but their labor to sell in order to survive, but are either artisans or skilled workers, which means that they are able to sort of leverage things like improved pay, uh, greater social security, improved conditions of work, more um, sort of uh, solidarity with um, their bosses and clients, uh, having not really many problems with general cost of living, and also, and very importantly, prospects of advancement. So a way of imagining yourself um, as one day the firm owner rather than the worker. Uh, I think I, I saw this expressed in a really great way recently where someone said that the reason why there's so little working class solidarity is because we've been conditioned to view ourselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. So everyone is on the path to being a sort of capitalist. Everyone's on the path to being a millionaire, but they just haven't quite got there yet. And uh, I think it's really important to sort of absolutely obliterate this myth. And so this is kind of like, these are the conditions that architecture um, developed under and and we still see a lot of uh, the legacy of these conditions today but what i would argue is that over the last 50 years virtually all of these benefits and conditions of the sort of labor aristocracy have uh, evaporated from the lives of architectural workers and i think largely we can thank these guys for that um so uh, obviously not them necessarily personally but what they represent uh, in the form of uh, neoliberalism. And so I, I think it's really useful to just kind of take a step back and contextualize where we are right now, like as a profession and as a political economy. 
And when I say neoliberalism, um, <laughs> what I mean is a political sort of ideology which believes in the uh, primacy of the free market over the interventions of the state. And that ideology is expressed, as you can see, in um, the 80s when people like Thatcher came into power, the sort of severe drop-off of public corporations, which would have benefited architects and would have been a vehicle through which architects could get public work. And you can also see how this logic has continued to the current day, especially through the period of austerity, to where even the funding of local government and central government has inverted. And so now the ability of the state, the ability of public corporations to effectively provide social security and welfare has all but vanished. It's also important to look at the way that neoliberalism has enforced these changes. So typically the way that we would be able to resist something like this, our kind of greatest power as workers is through organizing as workers and through unions. And you can see that um, another very intentional consequence of neoliberal governance has been the sort of gradual dismantling of unions and labor rights. So you can see that um, there's a kind of striking um, balance, or not balance, but a striking sort of connection between um, the union density of the UK and income quality over um, the last sort of 100 years. And obviously, we don't want to get into correlation as causation, but it makes you think. We can also see in the same sort of um, time frame. This is where I wish I had a laser pointer or something. Maybe it'll just actually just come around. Um, but we can also see over this time frame, you've got labor productivity as that blue line there, and then you've got median earnings as the green line at the bottom. And so what this graph is showing is that although productivity has continued to rise, the median pay that you get for being more productive has decoupled from your productivity. And this, you know, so productivity increases mainly because of things like technology and more organized workplaces. So you move from hand drafting to AutoCAD to Revit and your productivity goes up, you can get more done in an hour. But as you can see, that increased productivity, that increased value that you're producing is not necessarily going back to you. So um, this is another important um, way of understanding the political economy that we are sort of situating ourselves with, uh, within and that has developed um, over that neoliberal period. Now, the reason why I think it's so rare to see architects act beyond the realm of design and act politically is largely because, um, like I sort of alluded to before, Architecture traditionally has been a very privileged um, profession of the sort of labor aristocracy. So for the, most of this period, the people you would find in architecture have been sort of sheltered from the worst ravages of the free market. And um, I think this is reflected in this uh, 2021 study that found uh, architecture and planning to be the highest uh, privileged profession um, of, of the list that you see presented here. And privilege here de de uh, defined as having um, one or more parents in a managerial position. So, you know, we can kind of maybe argue about the effectiveness of the definition, but um, it's been applied equally to all of these different um, careers and architecture and town planning came out on top. So I think that's instructive um, and uh, quite foundational to the lack of organizing that we've seen from architects historically. Now, where this starts to change and why I refer to um, this sort of section as the proletarianization of architectural workers is that because of neoliberalism, because of the departure of, um, because of the decoupling of productivity and wages, because of the loss of social housing, because of the attacks on the welfare state, 
wealth is becoming increasingly concentrated in older age, in older age groups. People entering the architecture profession are finding their living conditions more and more under attack. Um, and while you know this is a class thing, it is also very much divided according to age. So you can see home ownership by age um, for people born after the 1980s has radically, radically dropped off. And when we look at that previous graph of wealth distribution, wealth in the UK is you know, largely steered by things like home ownership and asset ownership. We can see that this, um, you know, is also reflected not only in our individual circumstances and the wider sort of political economy, but it's also reflected in what it is that we are allowed to do as architects. So in 1976, 49% of all UK architects worked for the public sector. So if you remember that first diagram and the drop off of public corporations, that is what then eventually led to through the neoliberal process, that percentage dropping to uh, currently now 0.7% um, work for the public sector. So essentially what we've seen is the privatization of architectural practice. And this is another really enormous factor in the sort of political apathy of architects, in my opinion, because um, our work, which was once inherently oriented towards some notion of the public good, is now uh, virtually completely steered by the interests of capital. And again, reflecting on what that means in terms of the proletarianization of architectural workers, that means that rather than sort of relatively safe and secure public work, um, architecture has had, to have, has had to enter the domain of the free market, which means um, competition, it means having to reduce your fees to win work uh, over someone else, and what happens when the fees of architectural work come down and down and down and down, they take it out of the salaries of the most junior people. So this is uh, adjusted for CPI, um, salary of part one architectural assistance, the first job that you typically have uh, after your bachelor's. And you can see that since 2006, part ones have been getting paid less in real terms. So, and though the data wasn't available for it, I imagine if you extended this back even further, um, decades prior to this, you would see that it's dropped even more. So in real terms, you're being paid less for not the same work, but more work because you're more productive than someone was in 2006 now because of technology. So this is a visual representation of the proletarianization of architectural workers. This is a visual representation of the proletarianization of architectural workers because most recent um, Reba salary study found that the sort of median salary of a part one at a Reba practice was 22,000. Guess what the minimum wage is? 21,673. So the gaps that uh, separate architectural workers from groups that we see as traditionally constituting the working class have virtually vanished. Like we, we are the working class now. And this is uh, probably the reason why this is such a popular image because you know I, I really do believe that like anyone under the age of 50 can just feel this in their bones. Like everything has gone really, really, really bad, uh, but we'll, you know, at least we've got coffee. Um, and so this, that I think is really important to get, that understanding of not only the sort of political economic processes of uh, the last several decades, and also our sort of class position within that context, but it's also, I think, really useful to look at how, well, how does this actually affect not just us personally, but how does this affect the built environment? What, what is the kind of architectural work that is allowed uh, to take place under capitalism? And again, I think this is a really good way of um, holding some of these concepts in your mind. Again, like a meme, but a great vehicle for uh, essentially a Marxist critique of uh, um, labor value. So you probably, you might not be able to read that, so I'll read it for you. It says, 
my co-workers and I produce 3 million worth of goods every year. The materials and utilities cost 800,000, the tools cost 200,000, and all of us combined get paid 500,000, which means that there's a million 500,000 being paid to someone who didn't contribute to the work at all. Oh, fuck. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a meme synthesis of, uh, uh, what you might call the labor theory of value. Um, and this is where I get to sort of get quite Marxist with you guys, which is very, uh, exciting to me. So let's, let's get into it. Let's, let's start actually unpacking some of these terms and some of these, uh, concepts, because I think that it's so, so, so important to understand the mechanisms that drive, uh, capital because these are the things that dictate every aspect of your life so i'm just going to take you through what i think are some of the most important sort of terms and um, concepts to understand when we look not just at architecture but at every aspect of the world so we'll start with what's most familiar to us the sort of working game now um what you sort of have to understand is that for a business to work, you have to produce more value than you are getting returned to you in a salary. If you were paid 100% of the value that you generated, there would be no profit for the business, the business would cease to exist. So that means that through the course of the working day, you don't have to only produce the value that is the necessary value for you to get paid, for you to pay your bills, pay for food, sustain your life, but you also have to generate surplus value, which then goes up the sort of food chain to your boss or your boss's boss or client or whoever. And this is, this is fundamentally how everything works. This is how your job works. This is how, unless you're working in, um, something like a public enterprise, which is publicly funded, this is how all private employment works at the most basic level. And what this means is that for your boss, there's two primary concerns for them to increase their profits and therefore be able to increase their ability to compete with others. And that is either increasing productivity, which means that you're generating more value in the same amount of time, so that necessary value bar gets pushed over there and then more surplus value is produced. So this is why employers are so interested in you being productive, you not taking breaks, you using the most up-to-date software that can produce things as quickly as possible. It's because the more productive you are, the quicker your working day enters the period of generating surplus value rather than necessary value. The other way to do this is to make the working day longer. So Obviously, the, this a very, very familiar tactic for people in architecture is unpaid overtime. So if you aren't generating enough surplus value in your eight hours, then your employer is going to um, try and compel you to stay for longer than that. And that is why unpaid overtime is such a massive, um, you know, observable condition <laughs> all throughout architecture. So if we kind of lay this out diagrammatically, what we have is people who work, who have labor power. <laughs> labor power is just the capacity to do work. Your boss pays for your labor power. And then through labor, you're not only producing the value necessary to sustain yourself, but you're also producing surplus value. Uh, this is sort of this, the, the, the product of your work is sold under an exchange value and Within that exchange value, you have the necessary value necessary to reproduce yourself if it gets paid to you. And then you have the surplus value, which makes the profit. So a lot of this is like really kind of basic intuitive stuff, but having the language to describe the mechanisms of the process, I think is really, really useful. And now I'm going to get even more into it. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, two types of value that again, I, I really think it's useful to have this kind of language, um, even though it's like, it might feel like a lot, I, I do think it's really useful. And so there's, there's, there's kind of two types of value that are, according to uh, Marx, 
embodied in a commodity. A commodity is just a thing that's useful. It could be a table, a laptop, it could be you working to make something, all these things are commodities. So use value is just how useful is the thing. So um, the can is useful because it holds the drink. Um, use value, though, is qualitative, which means that a use value to me might be different to a use value to you. So I might like it more because I might, I might really like the design, but you might hate the design. So the use value is different. And this is the thing that most people in the world are concerned about, is how useful is an object, or how useful is something to me. And the way we live our lives is that we take the only commodity that we have, which is labor, unless you happen to own a um, factory, but most of us don't. So the only thing you do have to sell is labor. So you sell the commodity, the first C there, for money, and then you use the money to buy another commodity, say food, rent, et cetera, et cetera. So the mindset and the um, motivation of the working class is therefore oriented towards use values, towards how can I get things that are useful and that I need. Exchange value then is another kind of value that a commodity can embody. And an exchange value is how much can I get for this? So how much can I exchange this for? And can I exchange this for something which has more uh, value than it has. So the process is fully inverted there. So you have to begin with money, you have to begin with something to buy something, and then you sell it for, in theory, more than it's worth, so we go from M to M prime, and then you end <coughs> with more money than you began with. So this, you can see, is almost like a very basic idea of like merchant capital, where you buy something and you sell it for a higher price. And this is the this is the really really basic relationship that creates capitalism, um, and it's important to know as well that exchange value is quantitative. It's about the numeric relation between the value of one object and another. So the working class people who have to sell their labour um, are typically oriented towards use value, whereas um, a capitalist is more thinking about exchange value. So. How then does this come into the world of uh, architecture, right? Because the way that this plays out through capitalism writ large is that you get more money through the exchange or production of a commodity, and then you can throw that money back into circulation. And in theory, the process is endless. You can just keep getting more money back. You can keep um, throwing it back into circulation. And when money becomes capital is when it is always in circulation and it's always expanding, right? So for something to be capital, it doesn't have to just be in motion. It has to expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So how does this, how does this work in architecture then? How does this MCM, how does this capital relationship work uh, in the built environment? And how does it dictate the production and reproduction of the built environment? Well, I'm going to look at two popular uh, typologies of building that not only do we see everywhere, but uh, many of us have probably even worked on ourselves. So I'm going to start with the smaller scale of the two, which I call the education extension. <laughs> and this is the absolute darling of like the AJ Small Project Award, you know, these projects, it's a quirky little five person practice. They're charming, they wear workers' jackets, they, um, you know, they make these lovely colourful kitchen extensions and, you know, it's great, but there's so many of them, right? Like, it's such a consistent uh, typology of architectural production that we see today. And this is entirely because of the, uh, the dictates of capitalist production in the built environment. This is entirely because the clientele is someone like this, like the American gentrifier, or I guess in our case, to be the London gentrifier. And again, like the, the, the thing about a sort of materialist critique of capitalism is that while it is fun to kind of joke about these people, you're never really ascribing like morality or ethical blame to any of these people because they're all operating according to the mechanistic compulsions of capital. So, 
they're living the way they are, and they're the clients of small practices because of uh, inequality. So because um, since, again, since the 80s, uh, the Gini coefficient, the, the standard measure of inequality has risen because um, council housing has been sold off and um, housing has turned into a commodity. That is why so much of this kind of um, sphere <coughs> architectural project is dictated by um, this particular sort of subset of the population that can afford to buy a you know small house in like Southwark and then has the spare uh, cash to do a fancy extension. But the thing about this is that it's still sort of real capital, and by what I mean, uh, what I mean by that is that at least these guys are actually living in the house. At least they're actually using the house. At least the design has a, a clear concern of like use value, right? Like you're you're getting the, the materiality that people like. You're clearly designing it to be very functional. It has a clear use value, and the people who pay for it are going to live in it and use it. Um, it has at least that to say about it. What doesn't necessarily have that to say about it as much? is the other typology, which, again, especially in London, we've become very, very, very familiar with. And this one I kind of categorize as vacuous new London vernacular bullshit. Um, <laughs> and again, like, oh, this will be fun. Does anyone know the name of any of these buildings? I don't know what I'm going to do. Do you know the name of it? No. Do you know who designed it? No. Does anyone know who designed them? Or any one of them? Does anyone know who designed one of them? No? They're all designed by HMM. Um, not, not to specifically throw shade, because they're not the only ones, but like, you know, um, these, these are all designed by one practice. And um, this, in terms of the way that capital is producing the built environment, is an entirely different um, sort of capital com compulsion to the one we looked at previously. Because this one uh, clearly is not oriented towards like a production of a use value, right? Like how useful this is as housing, how high quality this is as housing is evidently not the steering um, factor in this. So, and and as we know, vacancy rates in cities are just increasing and increasing. So a lot of the time, people aren't even living in these buildings. They just exist as um, investment vehicles for speculative real estate, right? So again, looking at the way that land value and housing and assets overlying land, like buildings, looking at the way that that has changed over um, the last few decades, you can see that the value of land has just absolutely skyrocketed. Housing prices have completely outstripped earnings by any scale of the imagination. And this is the, this is the aspect of capital which is steering these um, this production of built environment. And like I said, at least with the previous typology, we can at least say that people are living in them. We can at least see that there is a use value being produced through the education extension. But this is far more akin to something called fictitious capital, which is, you know, when the promise or the expectation of value production is dictating the price of something. So it's what happened in the 2008 financial crash is the, the, the promise of future value generation was used to inflate um, prices. It was used as a motivation to give mortgages to people who wouldn't be able to pay them back. And when that contradiction between value and fictitious capital becomes too extreme, that's when you start to see crisis. So this is why everyone is always talking about like the housing bubble, when's the housing bubble gonna pop? It's because this, the, the way that this kind of business of architecture is being conducted is, um, is, is purely concerned with exchange value. It's purely concerned with um, building something to inflate land value, to sell it or rent it. And that, that, that's the thing that drives it. That's the fundamental thing. And I think another interesting dynamic that plays out here is that because there's more, because the sort of 
you know, the, the kind of capital we're talking about and the um, ability to profit off of this fictitious capital is so significant. It means you get a lot more competition involved in this kind of production as well. So the obviously the kind of competition that is uh, mostly sort of decried by architects is the competition between architects and developers. And the sad sort of reality of this is, is that architects are at a fundamental disadvantage in uh, intercapitalist competition uh, with developers. And I think the reason for that is summed up quite nicely in this uh, quote, which says, uh, craftsmanship, good work, was no longer the essential foundation of good earnings. If anything, it was now a liability, since it stood in the way of the sky-high wages, which could be earned by the men who deliberately and consciously put speed and skimping before sound work. Financially, the cowboy, the term is a one certain market, but seems to emerge in the building trade during the heyday of the lump in the 1960s, could do better than the good tradesman. So though this is describing um, more like the contractor side, it just as easily applies to architects and developers because architects typically have to, as, as part of their sort of disciplinary remit, have to have some, however small, concern for use value and design, right? Which is fundamentally qualitative. So we have to kind of think about these concept design, spatial coordination, things like this. The developer doesn't really need to, though. The developer is mainly concerned with the production of a project in a way that increases the exchange value as much as possible. So architects are at a sort of, in terms of capitalist competition, are at a disadvantage because, you know, it, as a discipline, we are told to consider use value to some extent. And so this basically means that the architects that want to compete with developers and the architects that do a lot of these big projects, they start to operate in a similar <laughs> way to developers themselves. And um, this is why so many of the buildings that you know, I just put up on the screen and so many that you will see all around you every day in London look the same. Is because they're not steered by use value, they're not steered by design, they're steered by the desire to increase exchange value. And it's even, uh, you know, it's even impacting sort of very, very contemporary forms of practice. It is, it is even finding its way into the design process in terms of things like now, well, you know a way we can really do these two things quickly is if we just get AI to do it. And that way we don't even need to pay someone to do the concept design. Like we, we can just produce an image and then you know sell an image. And so uh, you see again, technology productivity starting to play a role in the capitalist production of the built environment. Because the only reason, or one of the main reasons you would choose to do this is because you can work quicker or you can work at less cost, which means that you can compete more easily with others. So, you know, it might feel like those two typologies that I set out almost present this choice of like, you know, which way Western architect do you want to be? the artisan and think about use value and um, nice primary colors on our walls, or do you want to be the bad developer? And the truth is, is that both of them are bad. Like fundamentally, both of them are built on uh, exploitation of workers. It's built on exploitation of uh, systems of land ownership. It's built on exploitation of material and energy use as well. So fundamentally, both of them are not modes of production of the built environment that we should be happy about. And now kind of getting to the position of, well, you know, this is talking about the end of architecture, right? So what on earth could possibly um, lead someone to frame things in that way? Well, there's Another really important aspect of production under capitalism that uh, I'm not going to go into too much because it is tending towards the even more complex side of things. But essentially, we know that in order to compete, productivity is always increasing, the graph on the left. You have a thing in capitalism called the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um, this exists because, uh, as Schumacher has demonstrated, 
to compete, you're always investing in new machines, programs, software, non-human things to increase productivity. And that means that your the salaries that you're paying to humans compared to the money that you're putting into machinery and fixed objects, the ratio is always then declining. And the problem of that is that if the compulsion all around the world in all business is to pay people less and pay more to machines, well, who's going to buy any of the stuff? Who's going to keep the machine going? Who's going to pay for things if um, the entire working class is deprived of reasonable salaries and material conditions? And the way that capitalism tries to um, negate this contradiction is through uh, macroeconomic growth, so total capital increasing, because if the tendency of the rate of profit to fall exists at the same level of capital production, well, then you need to constantly be producing more. The economy needs to constantly be growing in order to keep that profit amount either the same or increasing. And this is why every, virtually every single country in the world, how do they measure their success? Gross domestic product. And gross domestic product has to always, always, always increase, or that's really, really, really bad. And this is exactly why that seems bad. And so, you know, in that sense then, I guess architecture will be fine because if we just keep growing forever, then no contradiction, no crisis of capitalism, problem solved. Sadly, uh, nature doesn't really give a shit about the idea of perpetual growth. Um, and this really is really the only diagram I need to show to, uh, you know, I, I could potentially compress the entire talk into this one slide because this is the material reality of the end of architecture, because or the end of architecture as we currently know. Because, like I said, the success of a capitalist economy is uh, dictated by, uh, according to GDP, for the contradictions of capitalism to sort of be assuaged, we have to be growing all the time. The problem with that is that what is connected to economic GDP growth is carbon emissions and material extraction. And if we continue under the um, sort of global trajectory of increased GDP all around the world, then we're going to continue the material extraction, we're going to continue the carbon emissions that will create uh, a climate crisis which will lead to state and economic breakdown. And I'm going to give you like just one example of um, how this might play out. So I don't know, I don't think many people know this. Um, sand is the second most extracted natural resource on the planet. The only thing that we extract from on sand is water. And of that uh, mining of sand, about 75% of that goes into concrete production. So we're looking at, you know, the primary vehicle of the production of the built environment around the world right now is through steel and concrete. So we're looking at an incredibly important global ecological relationship upon which modern architecture depends. And then you've got this slightly uncomfortable truth, which is that it's predicted to run out by 2050. So, sorry, Ted Orlando. <laughs> no more concrete churches. Um, and this, this is this is the thing. This is the this is the material reality. Um, I use sand as an example, but obviously this is the material reality of all material relationships that we depend on. You know, Teslas are not going to solve uh, carbon emissions because we do not have the carbon budget to mine the lithium to create the electric cars, okay? Cars are fundamentally not a solution to any kind of transportation problem that we face because, like I said, we don't have the hydrocarbon budget to mine the lithium to make the cars. So. The way that we're framing a lot of these problems, the, uh, the kind of tacitly assumed perpetual growth and a sort of infinite capacity for material extraction is incredibly, incredibly problematic. And like most 
things who does it sort of hurt the most? Obviously, it hurts the global south the most. Because if we look at the consequences of things like sand extraction, we can see that it leads not only to carbon emissions, but to <coughs> consequences of material extraction like biodiversity loss, destruction of infrastructure, um, health tends to suffer all around any kind of mining operation because of air pollution, in particular matter. It's not just about carbon. It's also about the way that we relate to the material world around us. And so even if we take carbon off the table, we're still facing you know, what under capitalism is an insurmountable um, challenge. And again, just to sort of really hammer home the disparity here, this is the uh, a global map of the consumption consumption of sand, so of construction grade sand. So this is um, this shows again that global north south disparity. You can see where the mining of sand is being directed to develop, build, create infrastructure, and you can see the reproduction of colonial violence in this economic relationship. And it goes all the way into this sort of like green capitalist uh, misconception. It goes all the way to COP26 when we look at, for example, uh, the EU and the US blocking um, the loss and damage fund of COP26. So there's very clear, there's very clear understanding that the global South is going to be is going to experience far more uh, damage from the effects of the climate crisis and there's very you know transparent um attempts from capitalist countries to avoid any kind of financial liability for that so just again to like really um sum up a lot of the problems with even how we talk about you know sustainability and climate action um a transition to renewable energies in the global north premised on the ponder and exploitation of the lands of the people of the global south is not climate justice, it's green capitalism, it's green colonialism. So this is why um, I and many, many others center both our like architectural organizing but also climate organizing in this very fundamental anti-capitalist framing. And the mask is like really coming off about this, by the way, as well. Like I think it used to be more of a thing where people would try and hide the sort of colonial capitalist undertones, but now you've basically got like people like Elon Musk straight up saying that they're gonna overthrow a democratically elected uh, state so that they can get the lithium that they so desperately want for um, electric cars. Uh, yeah, we, we, re we really, really are in a very mask off kind of um, moment uh, in the last few years. And it's not, all about the global south either like i think it's it's kind of maybe easy to think about this as like a real riff where like ah oh, okay all the consequences are over there so sort of like maybe not after me the flood but like next to me the flood um and it's not even really that far next to you because is it, has anyone heard of this place before Fairborn? in wales so it's the first place in the uk that's predicted to be um a source of climate refugees because the rising um, sea level is predicted to make Fairborn uninhabitable within the next 15 years. So we're gonna have climate refugees in the UK within about 15 years, maybe sort of like three hours from where we are right now. So this really isn't like a very abstract, removed concept. This is, this is sort of quite terrifyingly real. And while you know a lot of this can sound really hopeless, I I, I think you know I, I I really encourage everyone to hold this not as like a, a, a like a pessimistic thing, but more of like an invitation to recast the future through challenging some of the most fundamental premises of the economy that we live in. And there's a lot of really great examples of people doing this, you know, obviously through wider <coughs> movements like, uh, you know, degrowth, uh, donor economics, things like this. But there's also people in architecture doing this as well. Um, you know, I really uh, like this sort of, um, it's a book, but also a sort of uh, graphic novel in the architectural review 
um, which is about architectural abstraction. Um, it's also based on a book called uh, The Global Moratorium on New Construction. And it basically kind of imagines what architecture might be like if we actually had to address these problems of extraction, of uh, global north-south divide, of the fundamental necessity to bring down our material and energy demand as a sort of civilization. And, you know, while it's mainly intended to be sort of quite provocational, I think it's not a blueprint. I think it is still really um, useful as a way of thinking, like, what after architecture as uh, a mode of capitalist reproduction of the built environment, after that ends, what then could it be? What, what might it be reborn as? And yeah, I think this um, quote from Kevin Rogan is a really good way of kind of thinking about what our options are right now. Um, so it says, the only alternative to the predatory overconsumption of finite resources is to utterly subordinate the practice of architecture to the betterment of human, human lives, to force, uh, by force if necessary. Of course, architecture already is dominated by the master of capital, which gives it form and ethos, a way of acting. I propose this master be usurped by a social force that seeks to devastate the capitalist world in favor of a human one. Architecture as it stands has become exceedingly adept at dying, but what if we learned to fight? And so that brings me, how am I doing for time? I feel like I'm like going, no, oh, not too bad, not too bad, that's all right. Yeah, that's good, because this is the final section, how to fight. And so in this last section, I'm going to talk about what I think are sort of some of the, you know, best vehicles that we have access to, to organize against uh, all of the horrible shit that I've spoken about and probably made you very depressed with tonight. Um, and, you know, we can start first with maybe some light reading. So there's lots of uh, great books if you feel like you want to get more into uh, the sort of theory and understanding of this. Doesn't all have to be scary, of course. There's lots of other nicer books. Um, that I think is great. Like I think having the reason why I tried to introduce some of those um, concepts of like value earlier is I think having a good grounding in theory, of political economic theory is really useful in positioning ourselves. Um, so by all means, you know, please ground yourself well. Um, maybe if a book is too much, um, maybe start with a couple of articles. Um, so I have two articles from uh, the failed architecture publication that I recommend to absolutely everyone. One is called Death to the Calling, a job in architecture is still a job. Um, and thinking about, you know, what can you do right now? What can you do from your position as a worker or a student? I think these two articles I'm going to show you are really useful in terms of understanding that one of the first things you can do is reject and deconstruct the myths that we are constantly uh, told to believe in our education and in practice. And probably the most pervasive myth is that Architecture is not a job, it's a calling. It's a, it's a spiritual thing that you're meant to do. And it's, it's, you know, it's not work, it's not labor. It's something special and above that. And this is the, um, you know, this is the sort of logical framework that encourages you to accept loads of unpaid overtime. This is the logic that encourages you to accept uh, salaries that are just barely scraping above the minimum wage. And, um, you know, this isn't just an abstract thing either. Like, you can see this even in the most mundane details of how we talk about the places we work. So if an architect, um, you know, the work an architect does, we don't refer to that like a business or a company, do we? We call that like a studio or a practice or an atelier. So we're always, even at... <laughs> Even at like the level of describing what we do as a business, like we're abstracting the fundamental, like real labor relationship, even at that level. So once you've kind of got with that, once you've embodied that, once you realize like, got it, okay, architecture, it's political, it's a job, it's a real thing. Uh, it's not this kind of uh, pseudo religious process. 
Um, the next thing to kind of deal with is the fact that while, yes, all design is political, not all politics is design. So if you want to really be politically effective, you can't just do it by designing things. You can't just do it through architecture. If you want to design public housing, you can't design it into existence. You have to uh, contribute to a fundamentally political process to create a political economy which decides that value should be distributed to public housing, and then you can design it. But it doesn't work the other way around. You can't design your way there. So there is obviously an incredibly important place for design in politics, but it's incredibly wrong-headed to assume that design practice is the primary medium and tool through which we will achieve political change. We need to realize that we have to step beyond design practice and operate politically. So how can you do that? Well, probably the most effective way is to join a union. And if you don't know what a union is, it's a collective of workers that leverage their uh, you know, collective <coughs> power to secure better conditions for themselves and for others. So um, within, within in the world of architecture, we have United Voices of the World Section of Architectural Workers, UBW SOAR, and uh, these guys only started in 2019, but they're already having a really amazing and profound effect on the profession. Highly, highly, highly recommend that everyone joins them. You can join them as a student, you can join them as a worker, you don't have to wait until you've uh, joined practice. It's not all about like um, flares and protesting. They also do have really great events where people are able to like create connections, build solidarity, learn things. Um, though, of course, if you do like protest, that's always an option too. Um, and that's that's how you join it, by the way. If, if anyone wants to do it right now, like, please go for it. Please take a photo of that. Uh, that'll take you to the uh, registration page for the Architecture Union. Highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, also, you have groups like Architects Climate Action Network, who also realize that you can't do effective climate action from the vehicle of private business, almost all of architecture being private business. So what do they what did they do instead? They created an organization that existed outside of private business that could pursue radical climate action. And they do that through, again, protests, they do that through masterclasses on uh, low and body carbon materials, they lobby government for uh, better climate regulation on the built environment. Um, and recently they joined the big one uh, with Extinction Rebellion. Um, so they're all about creating this kind of like larger movement around climate, both within and without the built environment. And again, if you want to join ACAM, you can do it right now. I'm taking notes on who's got their phones out. <laughs> and um, yeah, a, a, a just a really, really great group, really massive. They've uh, again also started in 2019, but they've already become a sort of international movement with uh, branches opening up in other parts of Europe as well. Um, or, you know, if you want to <laughs> do something like we did, you know, what we need is a phone. Um, you know, FAF started out of, yeah, nothing but like an Instagram page. So if you want to do something a bit more alternative in, in an organizing capacity, that there's your sort of, you know, your demonstration of how you can do that. Um, and I think uh, I, I really love um, holding this within a quote uh, from Catherine Heron, which is that architects have to work from a political base, and if there isn't one, you have to start it. Um, luckily, it's, like I've just shown, since 2019, you don't have to start it, but you can do if there's a particular directional strategy that you want to approach. Um, so luckily, we're in a time now where we can have more luxury about these choices. Um, and then the last thing, I want to sort of end with is that strategically trying to work towards and beyond the end of architecture and towards a sort of like post capital world, you can't just do it as architects. You need to think about building alliances. You need to think about, well, even in a miraculous situation where suddenly all architects were unionized and decided to withdraw our labor. Well, we have no protection of function, so developers can fill that void. 
So what we need to think about is how we don't just build solidarity and build um, kind of a working class power base in architecture, but also how we build alliances with other um, sectors of the construction industry. Beyond that, other sectors of the economy, we have to think about how this becomes uh, not just a union movement concerned with individual material conditions, but a larger labor movement which is concerned about um, a sort of full appropriation of the political economy for the benefit and the interest of the majority of people and for the planet. And the reason why I picked this photo as the sort of cover image for this lecture is that I think um, it's a really nice demonstration of building alliances because this is a photo of Leslie Bolton at the Battle of Walgrave and um, she was part of a group who supported minor strikes. Uh, she was a part of a group of um, women who often were either like wives of minors or they were just sort of political organizers in their own right. And they, alongside a lot of other groups who weren't directly involved in the union, demonstrated this really powerful form of solidarity where everyone came together towards a sort of common struggle. And the effect is the how effective that was is pretty clear because even though this particular event was fully uh, peaceful, they still had uh, dozens of uh, horseback police called on them. So I think that Leslie Bolton and you know the the groups and movements that she was part of are a really great illustration of what we need to do beyond just fighting, we also need to build alliances and we also need to find ways of effectively working together towards uh, and beyond the end of architecture. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lecture. Oh my God, there is a lot to process. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to cry about. Um, there's a lot to fix. Uh, and I'd like to start this Q&A session. If you have any questions or perhaps confessions that you're not afraid to share with everyone, I would like to start off with a question about education because you've been through the education system to the education system, right. and you've questioned the RIVA part one, part two, and how it all works. But I'm kind of interested in the curriculum. So like all the problems that you have addressed, does our curriculum need to change? Uh, should we learn new skills? Should we lose some outdated principles or some outdated ways of teaching students? What are your take on that? Yeah, it's it's a tough um, it's a tough sort of like. Uh, balance to hold because I think if you can sum up like the most prevalent debate about architectural education, at least the ones that I've witnessed, it always kind of boils down to should education be more like practice or should it be something else? And obviously you can see arguments for both. If it's more like practice, then it's easier for you to sort of slot into the mechanisms of the capitalist production and reproduction of the built environment. But if we ground ourselves in an understanding that that's something that we want to reject, then we need to think about, okay, in a sort of post-capital world, what use values do architects produce through their work? And I think that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, Charlotte's work uh, really speaks to. I hope this isn't making anyone sick, sorry. Um, this, is, this is the kind of thing that this sort of work speaks to. So in an ideal world, I think the education of architecture would be oriented towards um, the stewardship of land, the improvement of existing building stock, because we talk about things like climate action, 90% of the buildings that are going to exist in 2050 already exist. So why the hell are we so concerned with the 10% that are going to be built when there's so many problems with the 90% that already exist? Um, and I think it should be, uh, yeah, sort of, you know, firmly oriented towards uh, social use. Obviously, the, the tension and the difficulty for educators then is, well, 
had because because if you do that right now, there's there's very few jobs where you can work according to that. So you have the kind of like really difficult position of having to survive under capitalism while also trying to like keep one foot <coughs> in the income middle system and one foot in the emergent system. So it's it's a really tricky balance for universities and educators to strike. Um, but I think there's really good examples of people do, like figuring out new ways of responding to that. Like I think the part zero and part four programs at the LSA are really interesting. Um, trying to sort of open up uh, like short courses and like new ways into architecture that are focused more on um, like climate skills, low body carbon construction, retrofit, things like that. Um, so I think there's there's glimpses of, of how universities are starting to do like better things, but um, it you know it is it is a difficult one, and obviously that that tension is always um, something that has to be navigated. Yeah. Which one is part zero? Which one is part four? Part zero, I think, is like a almost like an introductory course. I think like outside of the undergrad, um, so I think that's more about grounding people. If anyone knows more about this than me, please speak up. But um, that's more about grounding people in the. I guess like the use value of what architecture could be. Whereas part four, as I understand it, more about s climate skills, skills like for a just transition of the built environment. It's more about things that you could learn, like even if you're a fully qualified architect, things that will probably still be new to you uh, that you could learn about now. Thank you. Um, we have a question from you. Um, this person like wants to remain anonymous. She feels quite frustrated and powerless about her existing condition of uh, working overtime on the competition. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how can junior people within industry, um, what are the day-to-day -day actions that people can take when working in uh, conditions, especially when in a climate where people are getting laid off in, um, in architecture firms right now in this poor economy? Yeah, so, I mean, the first, thing to do if you haven't already is join a union and i don't just say that like from a like from just a political perspective but also you have more protections if you are a union member than if you aren't so even at a very individual level it it makes sense to be in a union and don't leave it until you need it because legally you you can't seek advice i think for the first month or so after you join so you you, you want to be like in it before you need it rather than like thinking oh i'll just join if i get fired or something so having that as a kind of extra security is really important but also having that as a vehicle through which you can connect and build power with other people in the same situation you're in is also really important because you know as an individual you can't you can't fix it like as an individual you are fully at the whims of like your boss so the only way to you know effectively resist things like unpaid overtime is by connecting with other people who work at the practice you're in and start to build a sort of um you know collective way of resisting these conditions because in any practice you know there will be more unless you're in a really really tiny one in which case that's that is a difficult position to work out but in most cases there will be more of you unhappy about over time than those of you who are happy about it so organizing and unions and practice are just kind of like a vehicle for democratic uh you know control of that work really um so yeah, it's not a, a silver bullet, sadly, for whoever this person is, but um, I think it's a step towards uh, resisting that, that problem. Any more questions from you? Yeah, more questions over here. Um, my name is Norris. Um, I've just finished my part one um, not too long ago, so I'm looking forward into going into this architectural world. However, off to this slide, can I struck fear into my heart? But, um, my question is, how would I best equip myself for what's ahead and how to prepare myself for what's coming? And um, um, should I look at working for specific architectural businesses, companies, or 
um, you know, should I look into you know, going elsewhere? And also another thing as well is social media. Um, do you think it's got the power to really shift shift things um, within architectural practices? Um, so yeah, to your first question, um, the you know the the sort of conditions that I've spoken about today, I, I center them in architecture because obviously that's that's what I'm trained in. That's that's my position. That's where I've spent most of my life is in this sort of architectural world. But these conditions are certainly not exclusive to architecture. It's something that you will see in various forms in different sectors, um, industries all across the board. And obviously everything I spoke about to do with climate and ecology is also another inescapable thing. So I think the way to the, the way to think about like what you do after university is to try and understand where do you feel like you would be best positioned to try and uh, resist these various sort of problems that we've spoken about. So like to give a personal example, I don't work in architecture right now because um, I don't work in traditional architecture right now because uh, <clears throat> because of the domination of private practice. Um, and I really fundamentally want to do things that kind of go towards some kind of social uh, good. And so I, I work for Civic Square, which is a community interest company. And they're looking at things like retrofit, um, how to transition existing housing towards uh, uh, a state that is both socially and ecologically um, improved. So look, I think if, if that's something you're interested in, look first at the structure of a company. Because if it's a private company, that means they have to operate according to all of the like worst compulsions of capital. You have to think about how to make a profit, how to, there's always some kind of extractivism inherent in that. So you could look at like public practice, for example, is a program that looks at placing um, architectural workers in uh, public employment. That's a really great group to look at. Um, like I said, look at like CIC, look at nonprofits, things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, there's not enough like CIC nonprofit jobs for everyone because we still do live in capitalism. So I think if you do find yourself working for a private company, the thing is um, to yeah try and wherever you end up, just to try and like really connect as a person, as a worker with the other people who are there with you, because things will almost certainly not be ideal when you join just because of the state of the profession, but you and others do have the capacity to organize through <coughs> those conditions. So yeah, I think it's not, again, there's not really a sort of like perfect answer, but there's a way to contextualize yourself that I think is really useful and will hopefully lead to better conditions if, you know, sort of held well. Um, and then your second question, uh, I, I, I don't think social media like by itself can really change anything. Like at the end of the day, social media is just like comms, it's just communications. It's a way of like getting the message out there. It's a way of like gathering data and information. So I think it's really, really powerful. But at the end of the day, you know, it has to come with the threat of something material. It has to come with the threat of withdrawing labor. It has to come with the threat of protest. It has to come with the threat of blowing up a pipeline, like whatever. There has to be some material thing to back up the social media. So I think it's, so that's why we work so much with the union. That's why we work so much with ACAM is because by ourselves, we're just a, some funny pictures and uh, people chatting shit on the internet. But, only with alliances with different kinds of organizations can we collectively leverage uh, systems. So uh, I, th I think it's I think it's a very powerful part of a larger process that has happened. Hi, um, my name is hello. Uh, my name is Gökçen Efe. Uh, I'm graduated from Turkey. I moved to Finland five years ago, and I set up my small company. I work as self-employed as a design coordinator. So it's about me. In my experience, 
Uh, I graduated from 10 years ago from university. Uh, why I moved to England? Because I thought it's the problem in Turkey, <laughs> in architecture, because the uh, lowest payment in Turkey is the same in architecture, and the uh, studios are a few in architecture. So what was in a trying to achieve in university. So I thought if we move to the England, better. But what I faced in, in a couple of years, uh, from some of perspective, qualifications and how they produce and technical is a bit better and work environment is a bit better. But design point of view, um, I couldn't find I, I see that I'm listening the same problems in here. So it's good, just an idea. I think uh, the need to educate to the client, whose client is public. Because if they request it, uh, developers have to be changed. And then salaries and how it important architects in the um, business will be more important, I think. Because the people, what is the, sorry by English, what is in, uh, in front of them, they believe and they see that. Now they think they have to uh, join, the, um, what is it? They have to buy from these plots, they have to live in these areas. But if we, uh, if we, um, Grant on the much more horizontal the cities, and if we put the ideas to the people to live in the unique houses just for them, and design just for them from an architect, and if they can see that they can be attached by them by the architects and give the, the, what what their dream uh, for just only to them to live or or maybe commercial areas. So I think we need to do um, touch directly to clients because the developers in the middle, the, who is producing the idea and who will use it in the middle developers now. If we can jump them, how they jump me as the in the, for example, you show the table and show the processing stage and how they jump us. I think we need to jump them to make sure we are on the process too. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think there's definitely like a space for trying to convince clients. And I think the space that we see the most success in convincing clients is um, the, uh, it's the small scale. So this is generally the space where I think you'll see architects having success with like convincing people to retrofit, to use low and body carbon materials, uh, things like this. But I think the difference is like the motivation behind the client. So the motivation behind this client is very oriented towards using the space and it being a good space. The motivation of this client is that the number in their bank account goes up. So the problem, the problem with convincing them is that it's not really a lack of understanding. They know that the buildings probably aren't going to be great. They know that they're probably not good for the environment either, but they also know that it's going to make them money to do it. So it's not really a personal thing of like, convincing a person to be good or trying to stop a person from being bad. It's it's fundamentally the way the where they where they are in society, they are fundamentally compelled to make these decisions because of capital, because of the way that they sustain themselves financially. So those I think are the ones that it's more difficult than just convincing them because it's not it's not really a knowledge thing. Like we've, we've known about climate and ecological collapse for decades. We've known for such a long time. Um, the people in power have known for such a long time, and yet action wasn't taken. And that wasn't an education problem. It was the fact that they were stuck in a production process, which is all about 
accumulation and, accu and accumulating more capital. So it wasn't. It's not really sort of like a technocratic barrier of knowledge or uh, willingness. It's it's really really about like the, the economy that they exist within. So I think there is a space to think about clients in certain contexts. But then I think there's another point where the client is always going to be driven by seeing the built environment as an investment more than as a place that people live, and that that's why we always bring our analysis to the level of the political economy rather than the individual, because it's the political economy that is compelling people to behave in these ways. Um, but as with everything, you know, there's that obviously there is also a place for trying to educate and convince clients as well. But I think it's not, we need to do that and all of the other like wider political economic things as well. Okay. We have time for uh, like one or two more questions. Hey, thanks so much for that presentation. I thought it was awesome um, and really great to kind of see you explain things uh, in the way you did, right? Um, so uh, hopefully I can get to the end of this point because there's so many things that I'd love to kind of talk to you about with the presentation. There was a lot that um, chimes with my own kind of research in which is a kind of Marxist neoliberal kind of critique of uh, education and spaces like this, the university, um, which is coming out through kind of a practice-based approach to how we might do education differently. Um, and what we do there is um, kind of confront with this idea that you were talking about with this link between architecture, architects and capital, which you know, I might say kind of you started your story at kind of neoliberalism, but we could probably draw the line way back to maybe even when the profession started. Um, you guys never would have got home. Like, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so maybe I'm glad you did it. But, you know, that's kind of where I sort of yeah. really pin it, really. And, and that says a lot about the link between the architecture, the built environment, the profession and capital. They're kind of they're kind of put together like this and um i've really found the way you kind of put it so up front the kind of the end of architecture i think is a great way to frame it because certainly what's happening in in our kind of small design school but the, the, the discussions we're having with participants and students is like maybe we shouldn't really be even talking about it in terms of architecture at, like calling it architecture and it's more kind of towards perhaps critical spatial practice or feminist practice, feminist spatial practice. These are kind of the terms that we're using quite a lot with our participants anyway, students. So I guess where this is going, my question is, um, it's great that you're kind of coming to places like the RBA and they are uh, sort of stuck, stuck in the way of their way of describing what architecture is. Mm. Do you think FAF has a position on or kind of a role in trying to change what architects should be? What's, do you have a kind of vision maybe what that is? That's a, you know, a massive thing. I don't expect you to kind of have an answer to that, but it'd be great for you maybe to kind of speak a bit about, yeah, I guess your tensions with what the RIBA set themselves to be as kind of the prescribed way of doing practice in architecture and, yeah. Yeah, whether you think you have a role to kind of push them and push them, push them on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, like the, yeah, I th I th the, uh, w when it comes to like, I guess, like the, the emergent form of like a, a new architecture or whatever, I, I think that is dictated entirely by <laughs> the mode of production that might emerge after capitalism. So I don't think that's necessarily something that you can almost like engineer necessarily. Um, Cause you know, it's fundamentally like an incredibly vast mm -hmm. political economic process. Um, I, I think the way I try and hold these ideas and the way I try to think about institutions like the Reba is that um, like our target is the sort of 
um, political economic base, the mode of production, that's the thing we want to change. From that base, you get institutions, you get like the legal system, you get Reba, you get like uh, cultural institutions, all things emerge from that base. And I think we can like leverage the institutions against the base, but we can't find solutions in the institutions. So for me, Reba will never be a perfect vehicle for anything because they are in separate, they are like intrinsically, uh, they, they hold the sort of political economic base within them, but that doesn't mean that they can't be useful in, from the point of view of like organizing or like in the same way that a union in some ways helps actually like reduce the contradictions of capital. Um, but we, we shouldn't throw unions under the bus for that because they're improving the material conditions so that people can organize further. I think the same way about Reba, where Reba will never be a solution in of itself, but we can leverage its institutional position. We can leverage its um, funding to try and improve conditions for people working towards this kind of fundamental change um, beyond architecture. So when we do the next um, uh, election cycle for the council, where the thing we're doing differently this time is that we're couching it within the language of just transition. So it's more about we're, we're, we're centering that bigger goal, that bigger ambition, and we're saying a Reba council seat is one way that someone can try and leverage an institution as part of their much larger process. So I think the way that we're going to run that sort of campaign is a good um, indicator of, yeah, how, how I try and hold all of the different things in uh, my head. But I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that was great. Yeah, thanks. I'm afraid we have to wrap up this lecture. I'd like to thank audience for coming today and participating in the discussion. And thank you so much, Charlie, for this lecture. I'm so glad that we're recording it because it'd be very useful to come back to it. It's going to be published on our YouTube. So if you ever want to use it in your teaching, perhaps, or you want to share it with your friends, I think it's very useful. There's a lot of information there to go through. Um, we have another Inside Out on the 18th of May with Stu Fish. Look out for an announcement on our socials if you'd like to join that one. And please give the last round of applause for Charlie. Thank you.